A very good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to NUS. And uh, today is the, uh, we have another day of uh, NUS admissions and faculty sharing. And uh, this afternoon, uh, feel free uh, later today and this afternoon, feel free to sign up for, to attend the other talks by the specific faculties that, that they are offering causes that is of interest to you. And uh, uh, let me first get my slides up first and then we'll get started. So let me, uh, as uh, the first session for today's uh, NUS admissions and faculty sharing, let me first by giving you an overview about the NUS education. And you are actually at a very important juncture of your life. And the next thing you're going to look at is what are you going to do when you uh, at the university? What course of study? And before we do that, let me just highlight a key point here. The key point is that currently the university education has changed. There is a paradigm shift in university education. And university education is beyond a paper qualification. It's beyond purely accumulation of knowledge. Instead, it actually focuses on the integration of disciplinary knowledge and future ready skills. In terms of learning, it's gone the old days that is essentially blackboard and uh, lectures and tutorial classes. Now we are employing a innovative and varying pedagogies for the delivery of classes. You could even have a hybrid of online and face-to-face -face learning. At the same time, we know that the world now is very complex. Interdisciplinary learning opportunities have to be part of an, a university education because the problems of tomorrow are very complex. You need to bring in different disciplines to solve them. Knowledge of different disciplines, people with different skill sets to solve these complicated problems. At the same time, we want to provide our students with global learning opportunities and we take the employment of our graduates very seriously. So career preparation and internship opportunities are very, very important as well. And some of you may be thinking, what should I study at the university? Now, I know that this is a very important question to you. And to answer this very important question, let me ask you two other questions instead. What is your passion? What is your aptitude? You need to be passionate about what you want to study. You need to be good at what you are studying. Because being passionate about what you study, you will be good at it. And you're good at it, you will inspire you to learn even further. And if you look for a course of study, you will actually integrate knowledge and skill sets for you. And at the end of the day, we'll equip you with disciplinary knowledge and future ready skills. And your first job after graduation, most likely will be related to this particular course of study. And that is where passion and aptitude is very important again, because going to work, then you have to make sure that you really enjoy what you're, uh, what you're doing and you're good at what you're doing. So these are the, some of the key considerations that you should look at. And welcome to the NUS experience. And uh, NUS, as you, uh, many of you know, in terms of ranking, we are among the best in Asia and top 25 universities globally. We are a research-intensive, comprehensive university. And because of our size, Every year, we take in more than 7,000 students. And because of our size, we're able to offer more than 60 bachelor's degree program. We have very vibrant student life. We have more than 200 clubs and societies and interest group. Although Singapore is at one corner of the world, we, do, we are well connected with our more than 300 partner universities in over 40 countries. At the same time, our graduates are very employable. We are consistently ranked among the top 10 for global employability. And let me tell you a little bit more about the NUS stories. NUS is Singapore's first and largest university. This year, NUS is 117 years old. We have taught generations of architects, doctors, engineers, scientists, writers, economists, and so on and so forth. And being a research-intensive university, our research also impacts lives. And we're just getting started. If you ask me, how do, you this, how do I describe the NUS education? I would use the three Cs to describe the NUS education. Customizable, challenging, and current. How we are going to make it work, that is entirely up to you. 
And the first thing to do is that if you want to embark on the NUS education, first thing, choose a course of study. Choose your academic pathway. And being a comprehensive university, you have almost everything that, that you can think of in a big university that a big university can offer. If you're interested in humanities and sciences, you can apply to the College of Humanities and Sciences. You can apply for the Humanities and Sciences course. And you can embark on any of these majors under the Arts and Social Sciences, under the Science, or if you want to bring two disciplines together and integrate them together, we even have cross-disciplinary program like data science and economics, uh, PPE, philosophy, politics, and economics. For students who are interested in design and engineering, our College of Design Engineering offers majors in design, like architecture, industrial design, or majors in engineering. You just need to apply for an engineering course and you can pick any of these engineering majors under the course. Our School of Business offers three majors, Accountancy, Business Administration, and Real Estate. We have a very strong School of Computing. We actually offer four different courses in computing that, that will serve different parts of the computing industry, like business analytics, computer science, information security, and information system. We also offer you know, professional schools like medicine, dentistry, and law. We even have a music school. And for students who are interested in healthcare, we have courses in nursing and courses in pharmacy as well. Let me explain how the NUS education worked. Now, essentially, and most NUS degree is four years. Each year, you will take 10 modules. So there is a total of 40 modules that a typical NUS student will take. But among these 40 modules, roughly speaking, there are three baskets there. The first basket is what we call the common curriculum. I'll explain more in a moment. That will actually form the foundation of one's learning. The second basket, which is one, about one third, again, of uh, what you have, that is what we call the major requirements. That course of study that you are interested in, you know, engineering, humanities and sciences, then finally, there's a remaining one third, and that is really the fun part. That is what we call unrestricted electives. How this is going to work? Actually, these three basket uh, of these three uh, components of the what you're going to study among your 40 modules, these will actually build up towards the four key pillars of NUS education: common curriculum. Common curriculum in the sense that whether you are going to start if a course in business or a course in computing or a course in humanities and sciences, we need to have a broad-based intellectual foundation to prepare you. And the good thing about common curriculum is that we are not just common curriculum for the whole university. One size fits all. That's not the case. Instead, every faculty or, or every college they have their own common curriculum that's unique to, to, to actually uh, to prepare you for the, the, the study within that college. Then <clears throat> you choose uh, major requirements. And after that, what to do with the third component, unrestricted electives? That is the fun part. And for students who are very interested in a certain area of study, let's say a student is very interested to be an uh, 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 engineer and are very keen on mechanical engineering, then the student could actually use the unrestricted elective space to go deeper into mechanical engineering. They can even pick a specialization in aeronautical engineering. But there's still space because the unrestricted elective space uh, out of the 40 modules may range from 10 to 12 modules. So it could be a quite significant space. You can, apart from doing a specialization, you can take some of this space, and you complement your mechanical engineering study by doing a minor in physics. A minor in physics, that is related. So you, we give you full flexibility. You can go deep or you, want, you can actually acquire multiple competencies. And you can use this to actually facilitate an interdisciplinary approach in learning. Like, for example, uh, you, you can actually have a major in, let's say, business analytics, and you want to complement it with a second major in a different discipline, in a different college, like in humanities and sciences, like in a second major in economics, you can do that. You, we, are, we have packages 
that bring two different disciplines together. And we also allow you to actually have a DIY, do-it-yourself way of packaging two different areas together. So we provide you with an interdisciplinary approach in learning. And the basic question to ask is, why are we doing this? We want to prepare you for the future. We want you to do well in the future. So that brings me to the fourth pillar, which is lifelong learning. We prepare you well, we give you all the foundations, and you are ready for lifelong learning. We do have courses, there are graduate level courses, that it could be a graduate certificate, it could be uh, a master degree, and you can come back and take more classes to us, with us. And, and like what we always say, our commitment to our student is not just four years in the university education. Our commitment to our student is actually 20 years and beyond. So that is the what I summarized the four pillars of key pillars of NUS education. And let me give you a few examples. And uh, some of you may have been attending talks by these respective colleges already. Now, the first one is the College of Humanities and Sciences. And uh, this was uh, launched last year. What happens was this. We have two well-established and large faculties in NUS, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences and the Faculty of Science. Last year, we bring these two faculties together to provide you with an enhanced undergraduate experience that is delivering interdisciplinary learning at scale. Last year, we took in almost 2,000 students in the College of Humanities and Sciences. You can imagine the scale of the impact. There is a, there, there is a common curriculum that's specially curated to facilitate and provide the background for studies in humanities and sciences. And you can actually apply for the humanities and sciences course. There are many, many majors under that in arts and social sciences or in science. The moment you are into the humanities and sciences course, you can indicate a preferred major. No further selection. If you want to study psychology, go ahead. If you want to study life sciences, we will make it happen for you. And this actually gives you unparalleled flexibility. We create a space for you to do second major, minor, and so on and so forth. Riding on the success of the College of Humanities and Sciences, this year, we launched the College of Design and Engineering. Again, we have two very well-established schools. Our Faculty of Engineering, which is consistently ranked very high internationally uh, in terms of all kinds of ranking and our School of Design and Environment. They both have been around for a long time. This year, we merged them together to form the College of Design and Engineering. And this is to give you greater choice, more breadth, more flexibility in the student-centric curriculum. And again, there is a common curriculum. But this time around, the common curriculum is tailored for design and engineering. Then, let's say the student apply for the common engineering course. And this common engineering course, the moment you're in, if you're interested in mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, chemical engineering, we allow you to do that. No further selection. And at the same time, again, we create space. The space that is uh, for you to explore other things like a second major, a minor, or just taking a few modules outside what you're, uh, what you're majoring in. And this second major, minors, or, or anything outside, it doesn't have to be restricted to College of Design and Engineering. We work under the one NUS framework. You can take classes, courses in another faculty. No problem about that. And another major innovation that also started this year, NUS College. This is the first undergraduate honors college of NUS. And uh, as an honors college, it's a slightly different thing. Now, what it does is that this NUS college actually complements more than 50 majors offered by the faculties uh, of the different university. Like, for example, a student could be in the College of Humanities and Sciences, could be in School of Computing, or in the College of Design and Engineering, or NUS Business School, taking their respective modules. And at the same time, you can be part of NUS college. And NUS college here, what happens is that uh, the, uh, uh, instead of taking the, the full common curriculum of the respective home faculties, you take the common curriculum of NUS college. This common curriculum, as you can imagine, because it supports more than 50 majors, so you are going to see a really rich, interdisciplinary, innovative 
experience and you and we even incorporate global pathways inside NUS college that can be embedded into student exchange program. You will get to stay on campus for two years and, uh, and this will give you an immersive educational experience living in a tight uh, knit collegial community. And this year we're taking 400 students in the first batch of NUS college. And I think I've been alluding towards going beyond a single degree. I have been mentioning this, you know, some keywords, major, second major, minor, specialization. I think let me now put this in more concrete terms. Now, what is essentially, like I said right at the beginning, they are all together 40 majors, uh, 40 modules that a student will take. Major requirements, most of them is 15 modules some 20 modules. So it's 15 to 20 modules. Second major requirements, that is 10 modules. Lower intensity, and that you can use your unrestricted elective space to pursue. Specialization, five modules. You go deep into what you're interested in. Minor, five modules. And how you make it work, that is entirely up to you. Another thing that you can do is that you can even do a double degree. And you may say, one degree takes four years. Two degrees means eight years. I'm going to spend a long time in NUS. Now, uh, not to worry, this is not really the case. Depending on uh, uh, what you do, you can do a double degree, a Bachelor of Science degree, together with a Bachelor of uh, Arts degree or Bachelor of Social Sciences degree. You can do this even in four years in the College of Humanities and Sciences. Other places, you can, uh, other like, like combinations between School of Computing and the uh, College of Humanities and Sciences, you can do it in five years. So it's a range between four to five years to get two undergraduate degrees. And some students are interested to embark on joint degrees that NUS have with its partner university. And you will graduate with a degree that is issued by both NUS and the partner university. Other students are very adventurous. You want to work towards a bachelor's degree and a master degree concurrently. And that is what we call a concurrent degree program, one after another. And we want to empower you in your learning. We want you to learn the way that you want to. And we do understand that the jump between going from JC to university, that is taking quite a little bit of uh, getting used to. And at the same time at the university, we want you to, to, to make full use of opportunity to try out interesting causes without worrying about the grades. So we have what we call a grade-free first year. And what happened here is that in your first year, if you happen to like the grade, you can keep the grade and this can be counted towards your GPA, that's or CAP, we call CAP in NUS, that, that will be uh, counted towards the, your graduation requirement in terms of the class of honours that you're going to get. But if you don't like the grade, as long as you pass it, you can convert it into a pass-fail option. And that will give you the, the opportunity to get used to university life and to try out interesting courses without worrying too much about the grades. Some students want to do research. Now, you may think that to do research, I have to go to graduate school. That is not the case. We leverage on the strength of NUS as a research-intensive university, and we have undergraduate research program. You can do research in your final year or even much earlier, second year or third year. And we also allow you to design your own modules. Sometimes there's something that you really, really want to do, but you somehow find that uh, you, it's not offered. You can actually get a few friends together, design your own module so they can explore the boundaries of self-directed learning. So there are all these small opportunities here. And we want you to see the world. Take advantage of our global opportunities. Learn out of your comfort zone. You know that this process will allow you to develop personal life skills and expand the scope of your learning and you can apply to the real world. So here's a summary of the how we can make the work your classroom. Now, our flagship student exchange program allows you to spend one year or one semester in one of our more than 300 partner universities. Two things that come to your mind. Does it mean that uh, this is going to delay your graduation? That's not the case. Before you go for the student exchange program, we have academic advisors. They will sit down with you, 
walk through with you about the modules you're going to take so that everything can be mapped back towards your NUS graduation requirements. Then some students will say, does it mean that it's very expensive that if I go to Europe or United States for my student exchange program, I have to pay the school fees of the, the, the universities overseas, which can be very substantial. The good news is that if you go under our student exchange program, you will continue to pay NUS school fees, which is heavily subsidized by the government. And, but some students may say that spending one semester is too long. You want to spend less time. You can do a summer or winter program, spend three to six weeks, have a taste about studying overseas in one of our partner university. We also have opportunities for you to do research in renowned labs in our overseas partner university. And I want to highlight another interesting aspect of uh, how you can go for study abroad program, and that is our NUS overseas colleges. This program has been around for more than 20 years. These are for students who aspire to be entrepreneurs. You do an internship at a startup for one semester or even up to a year. And you take classes at renowned uni partner universities in terms of entrepreneurship and other areas. And you get to work in the startup and get a first-hand experience of life as an entrepreneur. This program has been very successful. We have more than 3,400 students who have gone through this and through the process, they have founded more than 800 companies. And you look at the places that we have in uh, that we have NUS overseas colleges. You can do it in North America, in Silicon Valley, in New York. You can do it in Europe or the Middle East, China or Southeast Asia. But it doesn't mean that all the excitement that you're going to get in the NUS education is you have to go overseas. Our campus is great. Our campus is really fun. You can get to discover yourself on campus as well. And you can make yourself at home. And the, in terms of uh, on-campus accommodation, we have actually expanded significantly with uh, five different types. Now, the first type is what we call the traditional halls of residence. For those of you who, uh, whose uh, parents could be NUS graduate, maybe some of them have actually heard this halls of residence before. Ask them, Cheers Hall, Raffles Hall, Yushok Ishak Hall, and I'm sure these names ring a bell to them. And what happens at the halls of residence? You get a place to stay and there are lots of activities, uh, cultural activities, community activities, sports activities there. So that is the halls of residence. More than 10 years ago, we started our university town and st we start to have residential colleges. Now, this is a completely different concept in the sense that you still have a place to stay. You still have lots of activities. At the same time, you take five modules of classes there. You integrate learning and living together with students from different parts of the campus. And these classes, five modules can be counted towards the common curriculum of your respective courses. This year, we up the stake for the concept of residential colleges, and that is the third type, which we call NUS College. A place to stay, lots of activities, and the in terms of classes that you take is no longer just five classes. It goes all the five modules. It will go all the way to 14 modules that even integrate overseas exposure inside. So that's NUS College. And but for some students who feel that I would prefer to have a place to stay, less activities, and you can actually join our student residences. It doesn't mean that it's very boring. It actually can be a very rich experience itself. We have a lot of international students from different countries who stay in the student residences, and that you can actually get to make friends with people from different parts of the world. And we have also introduced a new concept called houses. And this is a different concept. And this actually emphasizes more on bottom-up uh, activities, uh, mentorship, and of course, certainly a place to stay. And you get to connect pe with people, like-minded peers on campus. You know, whether you stay campus or through our clubs and society, I'm sure you'll find something that is in common with your friends in terms of music, arts, culture, sports, community service, or you can even form your own special interest group. And we prepare you well for your future employment. We have a center for future ready graduates that organizes programs, workshops, and events to prepare you for employment. And not to, not to forget, NUS is 117 years old. We have a lot of alumni. So we actually 
facilitate networking of our students with alumni with our platform called NUS Connect so that you can interact with alumni in careers for career planning and job opportunities. Now, we do acknowledge that internship is a very important aspect of a student's learning. Almost all our courses have internship opportunities. Some are compulsory internship, some are optional internships, but nevertheless, all internships can be counted towards graduation requirement. And we also have a platform for you to engage in sourcing for internship. And what to do? I saw many questions that uh, some of you have posted. You want to hear more about how to apply, about the admission requirements. So let me explain this now. Now, I believe that uh, many of you are presenting with Singapore Cambridge GCE A-Level. Our admission requirement is based on academic merit and meeting subject prerequisite. Why we talk about subject prerequisite is because we want to make sure that you have the necessary background to embark on that course of study. Like if you are going to study, uh, let's say medicine, you need to have H2 chemistry and another H2 science subject. We need to make sure that you have the necessary background. And in terms of uh, uh, how you get the rank points for A-level, I think all of you are very familiar. It's based on three H2 subject plus one H1 subject, either general paper or knowledge inquiry, project work, and of course, uh, you have to clear the mother tongue language requirement. For Singapore Cambridge GCE A-level, we have a scheme that we call first choice bonus point for all the courses that doesn't require interviews or additional tests. Now, uh, what are the courses that requires interviews or additional tests? I've listed on the slide. So what is this concept about first choice bonus point? Now, the first choice bonus points is that we recognize that passion is very important. We want you to think carefully about how you want to apply. What are the areas that you're passionate in? If you're passionate in that sub subject, put that course as the first choice and we'll give you up to 2.5 A-level points as a bonus point so that you have a head start in terms of competing for this course of study. Some of you may be presenting with uh, the IB diploma. Again, similar concept. IB diploma based on academic merit and subject prerequisite. And we will assess you based on your academic achievements in terms of your IB diploma, maximum IB points, 45. And we will make sure, and we also need you to clear mother tongue language requirements if you are uh, studying, uh, if you are a Singapore citizen or Singapore permanent residents. And then again, we want to recognize your passion. We have first choice bonus points for causes that doesn't require additional interviews or tests. And we have uh, one IB point for that. Now, I do notice that there are quite a number of you in the audience who are actually international students with international qualifications. Now, we, we NUS is very inclusive. We actually recognize all kinds of international uh, qualification. It could be Cambridge A-level, American high school, Australian high school, Canadian high school, Gao Kao, Indian 12, and so on and so forth. So all these will spell out the requirements and also the subject prerequisite. Go to our website and then click on that qualification that you're presenting and you can find the details. The application process for international applicants, actually application, uh, international qualification actually starts as early as mid-October. Do go to our website and you can find more details. And what kind of support do we have? So applying for admissions, that is one thing. The other things that you can apply for is scholarship. So we have a scholarship portal and we actually offer scholarships for well-rounded high achievements. And uh, for the Singaporean students, uh, we are looking for those with outstanding academic results, strong leadership qualities and potential and good CCA. And the flagship scholarship we're offering you are NUS Global Merit Scholarship, NUS Merit Scholarship. For students who are very good in sports or performing and visual arts, we also have specific scholarships for you as well. And every year we offer more than uh, 500, uh, more than 560 of these NUS scholarships. And the good thing about our NUS scholarships, all of them is full fee coverage, that means no tuition fee payment, plus living expenses. And depending on the tier of the scholarship, like NUS Global Marriage Scholarship, we even have funding for your overseas exposure as well. There are other scholarships for, uh, for other categories, 
do visit our uh, website and you can find the details there. And another thing that you may uh, want to consider applying is financial support, financial aid. So that is the third thing that you can consider applying, financial aid. Now, our admission policy is merit-based and needs blind. Financial difficulty will not impact the way that we assess you. And we have a wide range of schemes in terms of financial support. Like, for example, we have the uh, government bursaries and we also have our own NUS bursary to complement the government bursary. If you're thinking of staying on campus, we do have bursaries and grants for staying in the hall or residential colleges. For students wanting to have an overseas exposure, we have NUS awards for study abroad bursaries to help the students who need help. And at the same time, some students may say that uh, we, we need to have a loan to help them to go through the studies. You can apply for tuition fee loan. You can apply for NUS study loan. And we have other kinds of assistance loan as well. Now, you can actually use our financial needs calculator to estimate your expenses. And any annual cost of living in Singapore is estimated to be $6,000 a year, accommodation $4,600 a year. And let me highlight for Singapore uh, citizens the Enhanced Financial Aid Scheme that we launched this year. And what is this Enhanced Financial Aid Scheme? Now, we really want to support our students uh, for a full-fledged NUS education. So if your per capita income, that means total income in the family, divide by the number of members of your family. If your PCI, per capita income, is not more than $1,000, then you will get your government bursary as a Singapore citizen and whatever shortfall to pay the tuition fee, NUS bursary will top up everything for you so that there's no worries about tuition fees. And if your PCI is not more than 690, not only the full tuition fee coverage, we will provide you with $4,000 per year for living expenses. And we do understand that a complete comprehensive NUS education will involve uh, uh, you know, an on-campus stay and the overseas programs. We, we want you to go for this. And we already have bursaries for on-campus stay and overseas programs, but maybe some students find that it's still not enough to cover the entire course. So for students with PCI not more than 690, we offer the Opportunity Enhancement Grant, which is a grant of $10,000 over four years that you can top up whatever financial aid for, that we have provided for you on on-campus stay and overseas programs so that all students will have a chance to go for a full access of NUS education. So in short, let me summarize. When you apply, show us your strength. Make good use of your first choice bonus point and so that uh, you, you actually make it count and you take into account your interest and passion for the uh, chosen field of study. Some students, uh, we will actually look at beyond academic grades because we do understand and we want to assess our students holistically. And that is where we have avenue for aptitude-based admission as well. We will look at your ability, your interest, your work experience. And so do remember to provide the details under the achievement sections in the application form. So look out for the important dates and uh, you can have a sense about how competitive a certain course is by looking at the indicative grade profile and the subject prerequisites for the A-level students and the poly students. And do apply for financial aid, do apply for scholarship, and make good use of first choice bonus points and remember to list attitude based uh, achievements for aptitude based admission. So, these are the rough timeline for Singapore Cambridge GCE A level. The uh, application portal for admission, financial aid, and scholarship will start in uh, 24th of February, and then application portal will close in 19th of March. And from March to May, we will make all the offers, and then the outcome will be released progressively. Now, financial aid, we do understand that we want to be supportive. We want to be there for you throughout the year so you can actually apply throughout the year. Similar timeline for IB. IB starts a little bit earlier. You can apply for admission and financial aid as early as mid-October. Scholarship, you apply in February, March and May. To May, that is the release of the scholarship, uh, the, the outcomes of the admission for the IB. Now, of course, there may be students who are taking the May IB exams uh, who are based overseas. Uh, that we have to release the outcome after we get the results in July. 
And if you need more information, do visit our website. And uh, and if you have more questions, do write in for uh, uh, for uh, in in the uh, nus.edu stroke us admissions. And I'll stop here. And I look forward to answering your questions. So do send in your question for the Q and A. Uh, and so I'll stop screen and then. Turn the time back to Eunice. Thank you for, for your sharing. We'll now move on to the QA segment, and we have especially invited two NUS students, Eliora and Aditya, to share with us today. Eliora is a second year student from the NUS Faculty of Law and formerly from National Junior College. She is a recipient of the NUS Merit Scholarship and has since taken up the role as a NUS student ambassador. Recently, Eliora was an EXCO member of Law Camp 2020, working with her committee to organize fun field activities for the incoming freshmen. She is also involved in several law school clubs, including the Collaborative Dispute Resolution Club and Environmental Law Students Association. To substantiate her learning outside the classroom, she took up a legal internship at a corporate law firm, AEI Legal, over the summer break. Aditya is a second year student from the School of Computing, majoring in Business Analytics with a second major in Economics. Formerly from Raffles Institution, he is a recipient of the Esther and a resident at Pioneer House. Aditya acted as the Project Director for Freshman Orientation Week for the School of Computing, where he organized a camp for over 500 incoming freshmen, and he recently co-developed a cryptocurrency trading bot under his faculty's Orbital program, which provided the opportunity to explore his interest. The time over to Profco, who will be moderating the Q&A segment with Anadia. Profco, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eunice. And uh, I, it's really a great pleasure to have uh, 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 Ileona and uh, Aditya here. And uh, let, let me, let me before we begin with the Q&A, I saw there are a lot of uh, interesting questions that have already been posed, and I'll try to we, we will try, the three of us will try to answer that. And uh, maybe let me just uh, let uh, the, uh, my two uh, students here to say hello to you. And uh, so, uh, uh, Eliora, uh, would you like to say a few words to our participants first? Sure. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time to be here. Um, my name is Eliora. I'm currently a rising year two student in the Faculty of Law. Uh, I don't stay on any on-campus accommodations, but I am quite involved in law school student life, so feel free to ask me about that. Aditya, over to you. Hey everyone, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking your time on the weekend to be here. Uh, I'm Aditya, I'm a second year business analytics student, and as Prof Go mentioned, I'm also taking a second major in economics. I'm also staying on campus, but I've done both actually. I've stayed off campus and on campus for a semester each. So if you have any questions regarding the differences and how it felt like, you can feel free to ask me about that. Okay, okay, that's very good. Uh, okay, so uh, I think that I, I saw some questions already that uh, some of my colleagues uh, who are working very hard behind the scene to answer them. And uh, I think there they, they were some questions about, you know, this interdisciplinary path about double major, minor, and then they say that is it um, double major or double degrees? Is it going to be very challenging? And uh, so, and I think we have uh, Adia here who has actually complemented his business analytics, uh, business analytics uh, major uh, with a second major in econ. So let's hear from Adia about how is it like to do a double major, you know, that, and why do you do that in the first place? Okay, um, yeah, so I'm actually doing a second major in economics. And to be honest, the real reason I'm doing it is to have that balance between different subjects. I'm very used to the, you know, when you're in school, you learn a variety of subjects from all across. You learn bio, bio chem, maybe math, English. So you get very used to learning different things. But I realized when going into uni, I'll be very focused on the computing aspect. So I really wanted to balance it and balance my learning with economics. So that's why I chose a contrasting subject to take mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of workload, I wouldn't say it's that much different because how double majors work is that you substitute your uh, unrestricted electives, so your UEs, with your second major modules. So 
in the grand scheme of things, your workload doesn't change too much. Maybe you have to adjust your timetable a little to mm. accommodate the second major requirements. But it is definitely manageable. And one good thing that I realized after coming to NUS actually is when I applied to NUS, I didn't declare my second major because I was a bit undecided. But going into my first year, in my first semester, after hearing my seniors talk about it, I could actually declare this second major after my first semester. So NUS actually offered me the flexibility to, you know, change how I really want to go about my NUS life midway. And I, I believe they even allow you to make the decision even after the first year. So you don't have to worry about, oh, should I be really taking on the second major or will it be a lot? Because you're, you're always, you always have the option to make that decision even later on, rather than be in doing the admissions process. That that's that that's very assuring. Actually, I think uh, I'm very glad that Adia bring up this point here. Now, uh, in case uh, since uh, this this talk is focusing on admission, now on the admission application form, you will be asked to. Uh, apply for single degree courses, which everybody has to, because like I said, to embark on the NUS journey, you need to have a course of study. Then there is another part, which is called multidisciplinary degree program. This is what we call the NDP courses. Now, NDP courses, you, you see double major, double degree, major, minor combination. There's a wide suite. And this is what we call, we package them for you so that it makes it easy for you. But it doesn't mean that that is the only opportunity. That is something, our assurance to you that if you want to do this, we have this there for you. But some somebody like uh, Aditya has not decided, I believe you're coming at a single degree uh, course, and then you, you feel that I want it, I want to do this. And then you go for this uh, second major. Now, it could even be a DIY. You know, uh, I've seen students, like uh, I'm a mathematician, I've seen students who actually uh, major in mathematics and then uh, does uh, a second major or minor in Chinese studies. Uh, that is also possible. So you can even do whatever combination that you desire and you can actually select after you come into the campus. See how you cope first. You know, it's, the, it's a certain amount of adjustment. And another nice thing about our uh, double major, major, minor combination, if you look at what I was framing, major is, uh, uh, you know, 15 to 20 modules. The second major is 10 modules, minor is five modules. What happens if along the path, uh, you, you like your second major so much? It's possible that you can even upgrade it to a second degree and you're taking greater intensity or you find that you want to spend the, 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 the place that you have into uh, doing a minor instead so that you have in, enough space to explore other things. It's also possible. That means it's very scalable. You can go up, you can come down, you can start with a minor, you upgrade to a, ma uh, a second major, all these are possible. Now, in terms of all this, you can see that time management is an issue. And, uh, you know, like uh, uh, I I I Eliora uh, actually studied a very demanding course, law, very demanding, okay? So, and, but she's very active in uh, all kinds of law school uh, committees and competitions. So uh, maybe Eliora, you can share with us about how you deal with your time management and uh, actually get to juggle so many things together. I think that would be uh, uh, something that I think our participants in today's webinar would be interested to know. Sure. Um, so definitely, I agree with you, Prof Go, when you say that the course is demanding. Um, going to law school, I would say I had a bit of a culture shock because, you know, there are a lot of things that you need to do. Uh, the course itself is very academically rigorous. Um, however, I think going to university, what I wanted to prioritize is really having a balanced and holistic student life. Uh, for me, I knew that going to school, I didn't want to just be um, like focused only on mugging. I wanted to make sure I have a life outside. So that's my priority going to school. As to how I manage my commitments, I'll say that um, for me, I like to make sure that I write down everything that I have, put it in my calendar, make sure that I have time for everything. And another important thing to me is that while I like to take on commitments, I just try to make sure that I don't take on more than I can handle. So I just make sure that the workload for each commitment, for example, if it's something that is nearer to um, in the start of SEM 1 or the end of SEM 1, make sure that I balance everything and make sure I, that mm -hmm. I have enough time and capacity to commit to everything. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I see. That that's very good. So time management is something that uh and, and I guess you know uh I, I'm sure at the year you, you also have done enough time management to to do your double major, right? Um for me, yeah. So I think everyone in uni will experience mm-hmm. that culture shock when you first go in. Mm-hmm. And it's really about believing in yourself and trying to get through it because eventually everyone does pull through. So you just have to take the hardship and then take it in the right spirit and you will be able to do things that you didn't really expect you could do. Correct. Yeah. I think the, the whole idea here is that not so much about hardship, take the challenge, face the challenge, and then after that, grow with the uh, with the learning experience. Now, talking about challenge, you know, uh, I think some of you may be thinking about on-campus accommodation, and there are some questions about how to apply and things like that, and uh, and uh, Adia has actually stayed on campus before, and uh, or staying on campus, and uh, in this pioneer house, like I said, this is a new concept and uh, I, I was being rather vague and didn't want to say too much because I want to leave Adia to tell you about uh, what is it like, uh, how to apply for camp- on-campus accommodation, what is it like to stay as a pioneer batch of the pioneer house. So maybe you can tell us more about your pioneering experience. Okay, uh, as Prof Go mentioned, right, the application process for all varies from accommodation to accommodation. So one advice I could give you all at this moment is to really check the dates and recognize that different accommodations have different dates. Uh, but as he mentioned also, I'm the one of the first residents of Pioneer House. So if you caught the information in the slides earlier, there are different types of accommodation in NUS. They range from halls of residence to residential colleges and even houses now. So this is a new system that NUS has put in place. And at at the core, they're all quite similar in the sense that there are accommodation for you to live in. There, there's a place for you to socialize with your peers and to really have a support system in place so that you can balance that work-life culture or take on many commitments outside of your studies to but in this house system that I've been put into, I would say it's definitely been the highlight of my NUS journey so far. Uh, what it what sets the houses as, apart from the halls of residence, I would say, is that there's a very strong focus on peer support in the houses that I've noticed. In halls, you have a slightly higher um expectation to attend CCAs, to attend activities. But in houses, there's a great emphasis placed on student well-being. So every on every floor, you are grouped with seniors, juniors, and you have small clusters in which you participate in activities run by yourself. So just last week, we had a cluster breakfast session. So we went down to mm-hmm. the grocery store, we got ingredients for breakfast and we all came together in the pantry and made breakfast so it's a very wholesome experience i would say and it's a very heartwarming one and back to my point on peer support i think it's a very important aspect of a uni education regardless of whether you're staying on campus or not because they're bound to make friends across the faculty or even between the two different faculties and these friends are the ones that help you a lot in your life and make it a fun uni experience for you. That, that's very nicely summarized, you know, about a fun uni experience. Now, I, I saw one question came in, uh, hot and furious for uh, uh, Irora about, uh, about the law admission process, how to, you know, prepare about personal statement and maybe let me uh, take the question and expand that question. In general, you apply for university, probably there will be... Uh, interviews uh, for certain causes. Uh, You need to write a personal statement about your achievements and things like that. So maybe let's hear from somebody who has gone through, done that and succeeded, you know. Uh, Let's hear from uh, Irola. Okay, thanks, Prof. So in terms of my admission, um, how I prepared for the law admission process in specific, Okay, so the, the student has asked for any tips. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> um, I think one helpful tip I can give um, 
there's one misconception that for your law interview, you need to, you know, know the law, know a lot of cases. Um, that's absolutely not true. I think what's more important is really going in there with some general knowledge. And I think what the professors are looking for is someone who is able to articulate well, someone who is able to defend their own views. And those are the kind of skill sets and aptitudes that a law student, that they're looking for in a law student. So it's really being able to speak confidently, being able to answer the questions um, based on your own views and defend these views when they are questioned by the profs. I think that's quite important in the interview itself. Um, as for personal statement, um, because my personal statement was written uh, not just for law, but also for my scholarship application. So what I tried to do was just really try to summarize my whole uh, secondary school and JC experience holistically, talk about both academic and non-academic elements. And that was uh, just putting myself on a piece of paper. That's what I tried to do for my um, for the personal statement. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah, I think this is very good advice. You know, it's not about, you know, let's say building a CV. It's more about showing your passion, showing what you have done, what you have achieved and do it succinctly. I think uh, I think what we are looking really looking for is people who are going to make a difference and uh, who are passionate about what they are doing and who, who have the potential to do well in our system. Now, I, I think the, the one thing that I highlighted, my so-called three Cs of the NUS education is that, uh, you know, we, we, we want the student to have this customizable experience for them to take ownership of their learning. And I think both uh, uh, Adia and uh, uh, Irora actually went their way in their own way. Like uh, Adia, he actually did this uh, project based kind of a self-directed independent software development project, I think in your first year, um, uh, under this Orbiter program. And uh, and this is something like more like uh, independent kind of learning. So uh, let's hear from Adia first. Yeah. Okay, so this portion might be a bit more uh, computing specific. Uh, there was a program called Orbital in Computing that offered students the flexibility to take on something that they are interested in rather than the usual curriculum that you have to go through. So this project actually took place, right? Like it just ended a week ago. So it was over the summer holidays and it allowed you to develop an application or any program that you are interested in, in exchange for credits. So in, in short, I cleared one module over the summer doing something that I was very interested in doing. So my project, if you're interested, was uh, developing a cryptocurrency trading algorithm. So it has made good returns so far and I wouldn't have had the time or the uh, opportunity to do this without like, because I was given mentorship from the school, I was attached with an external mentor who was an ex-student of NUS. So I, I was really quite glad to be given this, this opportunity to like study something beyond the curriculum. And it really pushed me in terms of my knowledge in programming something that mm. I wouldn't have learned so fast and so quickly in school. And, and I presume that you, you actually get to apply all the theory that you see in the classroom and then doing something that is really current, you know, cryptocurrency. And, uh, and, and very, very importantly, you also get to be mentored by an alumni of uh, NUS. So, so this is how you see that we're bringing people in our ecosystem all together so that we can actually integrate knowledge and skill sets and what you study in the classroom to real world. And, uh, and uh, in the same vein, uh, uh, Ilona also uh, spent her summer very constructively <laughs> by doing an internship with a law firm. So uh, we were uh, asked Ilona to share about how is the internship experience and how does it relate to uh, what you study in law school and, uh, and get to see what is it like to be a lawyer, you know? So uh, over to you, uh, Ilona. Thanks, Prof. So just for some context, um, I did a three-week summer internship at a law firm. It is a boutique corporate law firm. So what they focus on would be company law, working with clients in business deals. That's the work that they do. Um, for me, it was a very enriching experience because as all of you know, when you're in school, you just learn from the textbook, you learn from slides, you go for lectures. But being in an actual law firm, um, I think there are two things that I learned, very important. One is about applying the law to real life situations because law is something that you often see on a piece of paper. You don't really see it in like, you know, life. 
So being able to witness how the law is able to shape business deals, how different types of elements are involved in negotiations or talking to business clients, that's one thing that I learned. Um, secondly, about internships in general, I think going for an internship, any internship, you know, learning about the office work, um, dressing up and going to Raffles Place, I think that's quite an interesting experience um, because I didn't do an internship in JC. So being able to just learn, you know, about internships and having the life of an office worker was quite interesting and I think it was quite a constructive use of my summer break. So overall, I really enjoyed my internship experience and I think that going into my second year of law school, I think it gives me a greater appreciation for what I'm studying. So I, I think, I think uh, both our students in their experiences, I think it's very clear that uh, actually uh, integrating what you study in the university to the real world, I think that actually give you a level up of the learning experience. So, and uh, I think uh, we have a, a lot of other uh, interesting webinars by the faculties uh, in the, the rest of the day. So I'll now pass the time back to uh, the, the MC to, to close the session. Uh, Eunice, please. Thank you, Prof. Go, Eliora, and Aditya for sharing your experience, insights, and sound advice. I hope they've managed to answer your questions and clarify your doubts. With that, we've come to the end of the admission sharing. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope that this webinar has been helpful. We understand that many of you have signed up for the various sharing sessions lined up for the rest of the day, and we hope that you will have a fruitful time. We greatly appreciate also if you could please take a few minutes to fill up a feedback form. You may scan the QR code on the screen that we'll be showing shortly or assess the link that we have shared on the chat board. Your feedback is important to us, so please let us know how we can improve. If you have any further queries, please write to askmissions.nus.edu.sd. Thank you once again. My colleagues and I are looking forward to receiving your application and warmly welcoming you to NUS. Have a great day ahead.